All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on uh, new data from uh, the Asan Medical Center. Uh, it should be very interesting with a lot of different uh, diverse presentations. I'm uh, David Cohen from Cardiovascular Research Foundation in New York and St. Francis Hospital, and my co-moderator is uh, Dr. Alan Young from Stanford University. Uh, we have a, a terrific panel here. We have Drs. Cho, Erng, uh, Fulavand, uh, 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 Jang Lim, Soyset, Wojciechowski, and Wong. Um, and so what we're going to do is just change the, um, the program just slightly in that we're going to have discussion, brief discussion after each presentation uh, rather than waiting to the end because I think the presentations are sufficiently different. So our first presentation is Dr. Uh, Doyen Kang from uh, Asa Medical Center, Interracial Differences in Characteristics and Outcomes After TAVR, the Trans-Pacific TAVR Register. Uh, thank you. In this session, we will uh, present and introduce our center's registry, uh, recent data. And uh, the first of my uh, presentation is about the TP TAVR registry and the interracial difference in characteristics and outcomes after TAVR. Uh, there are racial disparity and TAVR outcome difference, but it's not well known, especially for the Asian patient. In TVT registry, with uh, more than uh, 1,700 patients, and you can see that the other Asian is uh, known, presented as others, and then less than 1% or 1% of the whole data is Asian. So you can know that Asian patient is underrepresented population in TAVR registries and TAVR RCTs. And the Dr. Charan Lee and the Dr. Park the, published the paper about the state of that review in Asian population TAVA, and there are Ocean TAVI and Asian TAVI and K TAVI, two from Korea and one from the Japan, uh, has the, presented the Asian data, and uh, compared to the Western data, there's uh, some difference and similarity between the two uh, the race populations. So. The less than 1% of the TAVO in U.S. was Asian, and TAVO latecomer in many, uh, TAVO is a latecomer in many Asian countries, and small annulus, valve size, and small excess vessels in Asians as a unique feature, with a, especially for the frequent bicuspid aortic valve in Asians. So, and further, high prevalence of female gender in the very old age groups, and the culture of global learning will allow bidirectional education in optimal patient care, so we try to make the international interracial registry. And in Asa Medical Center, the PI is the dog park, and Professor Alan Young, uh, the, as the, the PI in Stanford University, and the, Dr. James Flaherty in Northwestern Memorial Hospital, we gathered data from the three hospitals. And the result was, uh, the initial result was published in Heart, the patient, uh, 1,400 patients was gathered, and the 581 patient was Asian, and 831 patient was non-Asian, and majorly the Asian patient was from uh, the medical center and some from the U.S. And uh, baseline characteristics, the you can see the body mass index is much larger in the non-Asian patient, and the STS score was lower in Asian patient. <laughs> And the Asian patient showed a large, high proportion of the diabetes and the more smokers and the lower MI history and lower cabbage history and lower atrial fibrillation or peripheral vascular disease history. And in echo findings and CT findings, aortic valve area was smaller in Asian patient and bicuspid aortic valve was more frequent, more uh, frequent in Asian patient, about 10% in our data. And the, the degree of the mitral insufficiency or tricuspid insufficiency more, more, more frequently in non-Asians. And the systolic annular area and perimeter was smaller in Asian patient. And the procedural characteristics may be related to, many of them is related to the, the central uh, character, but major was done in transfemoral and the process size 29 was more frequently used in non-Asian patient. Then conscious sedation was more used in Asian. And in hospital event, the death stroke or MI was similar, but bleeding was higher in Asian patient 
a major vascular complication related to the bleeding maybe uh, the, was higher in Asian patient, maybe related to the small vascular access site. And the performance pacemaker rate was a little bit lower in Asian patient. And 30 day outcomes, the composite of the death, stroke, rehospitalization was lower in Asian patient, mainly driven uh, with the rehospitalization. And 12 months observed clinical outcomes was a little bit better the in, also in Asian patient with a lower rate of the death and non-cardiac death and death or stroke. But well, because of the, the difference in baseline characteristics, we uh, should do the adjustment for the characteristic, uh, baseline characters. And in this Kaplan-Mai curve, you can see the death stroke and rehospitalization was a little bit lower and all cause deaths was also lower in Asian patient. Stroke and stroke was similar and rehospitalization was a little bit lower also in Asian patient. So I did a stepwise adjustment of the clinical outcomes with the, the demographics and clinical factors and echo parameters and procedural factors with a, with a serial adjustment and then you can see the primary composite outcome is not significantly different between Asian and non-Asian, and all cause mortality was not different between the two racial groups. Also with the other deaths and the cardiac death, stroke, other factors was not different after final multivariable analysis. So the, the, this study has the limitations because of the high selection bias and uncertainty bias because it was the registry based. And inter variability in care would affect the, the clinical outcomes. And data was from three high volume centers and not capture risk factors like frailty, social economic factors, or medications. And we did not uh, gather the core lab CT and echo data and showed clinical follow-up was just one year. So this is key message. The Asian and non-Asian patient, a BMI, and the body size, and the, the aortic valve area is larger in non-Asian non patient. Bicuspid aortic valve more frequent in Asian patient. And breathing complication, vascular complication, was more frequent in Asian patient. And permanent pacemaker was a little bit higher in non-Asian patient. However, although the clinical outcomes at one year was uh, seemed to be lower in Asian patient, however, after adjusting all baseline characteristics, the outcome was not different. Uh, was not different by the racial groups. And we are now preparing the second wave of the TP Tower registry because the numbers were small, and we we had only three. Uh, center data. We added the one large center in Zhejiang University in China, and we'll further expand with the more patient and longer clinical follow-up. In conclusion, we still have the unmet issue in interracial disparities in TAVR. Given increased life expectancy in the Asia Pacific, the field of TAVR is rapidly expanding, and there was substantial interracial difference in clinical, anatomic, and procedural characteristics in TAVR patients. And however, the disparities were not significant after adjustment. And future research into racial disparities can help optimize tower procedure in Asia Pacific countries, I expect. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So we'll have a few minutes discussion on this uh, uh, paper. So uh, let me know if anybody has any comments. So were you surprised? Um, about the findings, um, or were these as you expected? Uh, actually, it was uh, I expected. <laughs> yeah, we know that the Asian patient has a smaller body surface area and smaller valve area. And the outcome, uh, and also the, the Asian patient, SS score in main patients is lower than non-Asian patients, especially in the, U the US patient. And one would be because of the, the the, the, the reimbursement because of the high estate score, estate score would, could uh, perform the TAVI at the time because the registry, registry contains the older patient. And so 
But in Korea, the STS score limitation was not so strong, so the, there was a uh, significant difference in STS score, and the baseline characteristic difference would be derived from there, that difference. And clinical outcome, all would be from that baseline characteristic mm. difference. The race itself, I think, is not important, but patient baseline character is important. I mean, one of the myths that we had is that, you know, the Asians are smaller, therefore the access arteries are smaller. Yeah. It turns out really that is not that much difference between, yeah. and that's a really small. Okay. So, um, in, as you know, that most of the time if people are not smokers, the access is fine. It's fine. Yeah, yeah if you are smokers, obviously you have a history of peripheral vascular disease. That's, that's a, most of the time in the U.S. is smoking. If you, you know, most people actually, their femoral access is good enough. So. I mean, it is interesting to see the difference in the, frequency of bicuspids, that yeah. you treat more than two, two times as many bicuspids in Korea as uh, in, uh, yeah, in the United States, which... Yeah, even uh, higher in China, but we, also in Korea, the rate is higher. Yeah. And sometimes we treat the, the Caucasian patient, a typical obese patient, <laughs> and we have very... We experience a difficulty in access site <laughs> main. We are experts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You come get a consult. It's a totally from us. different yeah. patient. Yeah. 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 It's how you prep the patient, how to tape it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Dr. Flaherty probably in the yeah. Midwest <laughs> has the most experience. Yes. Are there any difference in procedure Pro factors? Yeah. More additional balloon in more Asian or more Caucasian or any other difference between you know Western and Asian topic? Uh, actually, the, the size of the valve was different. The, the, the Caucasian, non Asian patient, usually, um, many of the, them was Caucasian, used the, the large size balloon, more than 29 millimeter valves. But the further details of the ballooning size was not captured in this registry, so I could not define more. The difference in the permanent pacemaker implantation, you think it's because of the different time period with the improvement in the technique or more related to the size of the device? Or what can account for the difference? Uh, that's a very uh, difficult question uh, because that we only gather from, from the three centers, there's a strong collinearity between the lays and centers. And that there could be some factors that you mentioned. I think in the interest of time, we should move on to the next presentation. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Han Bit Park from the uh, Gannung um, Asan Hospital. And he's going to talk about racial differences of prosthesis patient mismatch after TAVR. Thank you. I'm Han Bit Park from Gangnam Hospital. It's an honor for me to have a presentation teach TAP. Today, my topic is the racial difference of prosthetic patient mismatch after TAVR. Uh, PPM was uh, first introduced in 1978. Mismatch can be considered to be present when the effective prosthetic valve area after insertion into the patient is less than that of normal human valve. PPM occurs when the effective orifice area of the process is too small in relation to the patient by side, resulting in abnormally high post-operative gradient. PPM has been the indexed EOA. Indexed EOA, EOA of the process divided by, divide by patient body surface area. Current definition of PPM after TAVR by Parker's three criteria, if BMI below 30, uh, index UA 0.85 to 0.66 is moderate PPM, index UA is above below 0.65 is severe PPM, and if BMI above 30, index UA 0.70 to 0.56 is moderate PPM, and below 0.55 is severe PPM. Let's see the previous study uh, of clinical impacts of PPM after TAVR. First is U.S. data in, from STS ACC TV registry. CBR PPM was 12% and moderate PPM was 25%. And CBR PPM was associated with higher mortality and heart failure hospitalization. Second, Japan's data from Ocean Tabi registry. CBR PPM was 0.7% and moderate PPM was above 9%. However, PPM was not associated with poor clinical outcome. So this is the Taiwan data. CBR PPM was 1.5% and moderate PPM was about 18%. And PPM was associated with a higher occult mortality and heart failure hospitalization. Summary of previous studies, ASEAN population had a relatively low prevalence of PPM than the Western population. However, clinical impact of PPM is still controversial. 
People have the top of might be a more concern in Asian population, considering their relative small annual size and pelvic implant size compared with Western population. However, evidence from Asian population on PPM to tower is still limited compared with Western population. There are no studies directly comparing interracial difference to upper PPM to tower. So we investigate the difference, uh, racial difference in PPM to tower on TP tower registry. <coughs> TP tower registry is an international multicenter observation court. Or is the consecutive patient with symptomatic CBRS who have undergone tower on Asian hospital is AMC in Korea and two US hospitals, Northwest Hospital and Stanford Hospital. We use the two criteria to define PPM. First is BACO2 criteria. It is the current definition when we study brand. If BMI below 30, index zero 0 0.85 to 0 0.66 is moderate PPM and below 0 0.65 severe PPM. And above BMI 30, index zero 0 0.70 to 0 0.61 is moderate PPM, below 0 0.65 is severe PPM. And we additionally analyze PPM by Chinese Society of Echocardiography criteria. This is the same as the current BAC3 criteria. Study primary outcome is a composite of death from any cause and stroke or the hospital is at one year. Total 1,101 patients to include in this analysis. 562 patients is Asian population and 539 patients is non-Asian population. In baseline characteristic, Asian population has a small BMI and small BSA and low STS score and more cardiovascular factors such as diabetes and hypertension and hyperlipidemia and chronic kidney disease, except apical fibrillation and peripheral artery disease. In echocardiography data, Asian population had more bicuspid valve and small aortic valve area and high mean pressure gradient and more moderate to severe AR. However, non-Asian population had more severe more to CBR, MR, and TR. And in CT finding, Asian population has a small annual perimeter and small annual area. In procedural characteristic, uh, both ASEAN and non-ASEAN patients mainly use the burden expandable device above 80%. But however, size of the sapientity device was not different. p is 0 0.80. And ASEAN population had more conscious sedation and more, more performed post dilation. In procedural complication, Asian population had more complication, both to severe PBL and diaphysis breathing, and major vascular complication and due to carpal diuresis. However, non-Asian population had more new, new permanent pacemaker. In post-procedural echocardiography data, EOA was not different for the Asian and non-Asian group. However, index EOA is more larger in Asian population. And previous on PPM by BAC criteria, in ASEAN population, severe PPM was 7% and moderate PPM was 27%, and non ASEAN population, severe PPM was 25% and moderate PPM was 30%. ASEAN population had a uh, less prevalence of PPM compared with non ASEAN population. By Chinese Society of Echocardiography uh, to define PPM, in ASEAN population, severe PPM was 7% and moderate PPM was 27%, and non ASEAN population, severe PPM was 22% and moderate PPM was 33%. Uh, Asian population had a less prevalence of PPM compared with non-Asian population. The predict of PPM in this data, the non-Asian population had more PPM and larger BMI and larger BSA and private cabbage history and similar aortic valve area and no performed post dilation. In clinical outcome, the no there are no significant difference between PPM and OPPM group, regardless of the Asia group and Asian and non-Asian population in primary outcome and PIT test and stroke dehospitalization. We additionally investigated to the to, uh, clinical impact of severe PPM by BACT criteria. There are no significant difference between severe PPM and OPPM group and Asian versus non-Asian group and primary outcome same and test is not similar and stroke and dehospitalization is similar. Uh, the, our study has several limitations. First is the selection bias because of a non randomized observed study. And in the side, second is the variability because of the multi-center history. Our study has a gen weak generality because of main use value expander valve center and high volume center. And there are no correlative evaluation for echocardiography data and CT data. Next, we, our study population is small sample size and short-term prior period. This is my last slide. ASEAN population had a significant lower incidence of PPM than those ASEAN population. 
In our observation code, the maze was similar be between PPM and non-PPM group regarding the maze, ASEAN versus non-ASEAN population. However, the clinical impact of PPM after the TAB is still controversial. For the longer, long time, part of studies are required to define universal and clinical relevant PPM and address its long term clinical outcomes and relative initial disparity. Thank you. It's just the presentation is open for discussion. Any questions from our panel? Well, do, do, do you think that the risk factors may have balanced out, like the Asian population has uh, had less uh, previous uh, surgery, which was strong predictor? Uh, it was stronger predictor than the presence of the uh, obesity, for example. So do you think that the, the, uh, the baseline risk was, was lower due to less uh, previous surgeries? Uh, ASEAN, uh, because uh, our Korea is uh, one issue, is a new investment issue, because uh, our uh, TAB just uh, last year, just uh, our TAB is uh, under in the investment because very high cost. So first, uh, um, several years ago, we suggested my first is Saba, but she is uh, rich. He can get the TAB. So last year, we can... We, our tower is under the investment, so maybe this issue is uh, less than uh, tower, more than uh, tower, our in ASEAN, Korea. Yeah. And one question is this definition of PPM. You know, I always feel a little sort of uneasy. I mean, a group of people decide and, and BMI adjustment, all that. I'm not quite sure what exactly that means. So what do you think, Dave? I mean, it, it, that's part of the fundamental thing, right? You're calling PPM according to a set of criteria yeah. that may not be Asian-related, may not be. I mean, it's uh, the, the. I mean, the B the BMI criteria. I mean, I, get, I mean, I, I think I, it was. <laughs> it's there because presumably, um, you know, adipose tissue doesn't require as much perfusion as muscle and brain and kidneys and other things that are fairly similar. So it's sort of like a lean uh, mass yeah. uh, type of correction is what they're. Uh, uh, trying to do. I mean, uh, the, you know, the data in the U.S., it was a little surprising to see, you know, no effect even of severe PPM. I th right. what, what is always surprising to see is how high, it, you know, in, the, in Western populations where we have uh, different body habitus, you know, how high the severe PPM is. Uh, that's, you know, and uh, it would be, that, that's why it's so important to see the trials that are going on, uh, like the SMART trial, looking at the, uh, different valve types to see whether we can improve prognosis by you know using a superannular valve uh, to uh, reduce the gradients uh, in the, in those patients, so um, I am equally mystified sometimes by PPM. <laughs> and the other part is obviously the definition with a gradient. I mean, a gradient, as you know, sometimes when you do a procedure the next day, a um, year later, it's completely different. Yep. And what exactly is that? When should we measure that? Almost right, because you know it, it's also dependent on hemodynamics, the patient. So I think you, and when you have an uncertain criteria and with a sort of that moving target of gradient, I think it's hard to know exactly what you're measuring. No, and, and I mean, and there are also our differences between measuring it anatomically, you know, based on a follow-up CT uh, versus the implanted size, right? I mean, so you're basing it, and, and I think you, you said you're basing your assessment of the uh, valve area based on the labeled size. It doesn't take into account post-dilation, so if you post-dilate it up, um, and got a larger, you know, so those, those numbers may be overestimates um, if you post dilated uh, for it. So it, is a, it still is a very, I think, complicated area. Um, yes. I think uh, the uh, analysis of the uh, PPM in the Asian and the non-Asian is uh, uh, the, uh, the cause is uh, different. What I mean is that the Asian population is a uh, high, high, is uh, small, less than 150, but uh, in the non-Asian main cause of obesity. Uh, the yeah. obesity. Yeah. So the, uh, sometimes we have uh, the confusion. The, what is that the intrinsically makes uh, the PPM in Asian is a small stature. In the uh, non-Asian, obesity. So, and second one is that the surgical PPM is a have a long-term follow-up. You know that even though the PPM, the, the regression of the bell barrier is a very minimal, 0.1 at one year. Is that the, and then we define the, what is the, the hard end point, such kind of. So just the one year follow-up after TABI, is a severe PPM is a non-significant, it's not a, a, a fair. Not long enough. Yeah, yeah. no, I think, that's, I think that's a very good point on the length of follow-up. Um, Great, Ms. Pressing, we should move to the next presentation. Thank you very much.
Um, so our next presentation is Dr. by Dr. Uh, uh, Kim from Asan Medical Center uh, on the prognostic impact of mildly impaired renal function after multivessel revascularization. Hello, everyone. I'm Teo Kim, the clinical assistant professor in the Department of Cardiology. What I'm going to present this time, the result of the study published at Jack 2022 entitled Prognostic Impact of Mild Impaired Renal Dysfunction After Multivessel Revascularization. There is nothing to declare as a conflict of the interest. Chronic kidney disease has a many direct negative effect on the cardiovascular system. The effect of the decreased renal function on the cardiovascular disease are attributed to the coexisting classical cardiovascular risk factor and non-classical CKD-related risk factor. Non-classical CKD-related risk factor include the bone disease and anemia and inflammation and the oxidative stress. Subclinical atherosthrombotic process based on the oxidative stress and inflammation and the endocellular dysfunction has been the observed in the early stage of renal dysfunction. As shown in the figure, based on the ASAM multivessel registry data, lower renal function is associated with the worst outcome after PCI. For the risk stratification in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease, understand the relative effect of the coronary vascularization according to the stage of renal dysfunction is crucial. However, the threshold of the renal function at which cardiovascular risk increased has not been, has not been clearly established. There are also insufficient data on the prognostic impact of the comparative outcome of PCI or cabbage for multivessel disease in patients with mild decreased renal function. In this context, we hypothesis that the risk of maize and the therapeutic benefit of the revascularization strategy might differ in the patient with mild impaired renal function compared with those with normal renal function or advanced renal dysfunction. Start design. The patient with multivessel coronary artery disease who underwent coronary revascularization with the cabbage or drug eluting stand between the January 2008, 2003 and April 2018 were divided into the five stages according to the renal function. The relative proportion of the fissure or cabbage of all patients according to the level of renal function are shown in the figure. Among them, the excluding the STEMI patient, stage one and stage two, stage three groups are full. Study end point, the pri primary outcome is the composite of the death and spontaneous MI or the stroke, and propensity, sco propensity score matching was used to assemble the code of patient with similar baseline characteristics. For comparison between the PCI and the CAPG in each renal function group, the separate propensity score was also derived. The baseline characteristics. The baseline clinical and anatomic the characteristics according to the stage one and two renal function are summarized in the table. Before the propensity score adjustment, there are significant differences in the several baseline characteristics. Overall, the patient with the stage one renal function Patients with stage 2 renal function were older and had a relatively higher prevalence of the comorbidity and the more extensive coronary artery disease. The difference in the baseline characteristics is more pronounced when the comparing the stage 3 renal function group with the stage 1 group. The comparing of the patient who underwent cabbage and the PCI in each renal function group, the patient who underwent cabbage had a higher clinical and anatomic risk factor profile compared with those who underwent the PCI in all renal function groups. The result, the overall population in the follow-up duration range from the two to 16 years, so 16 years during the follow-up, the observation, observed the cumulative incidence of the primary composite, the death spontaneous MI or stroke was significantly higher in the stage two group than in the stage one group. However, the in propensity score matched code, the adjusted risk for the primary composite outcome was not significantly different between the stage one and stage two groups. 
On the other hand, when the comparing the stage three with the stage one, the primary composite outcome was higher in the stage three Renal function group than in the stage one Renal function group in the both crude and the propensity score matched analysis. There was no significant difference in the adjusted the risk of the primary composite outcome between the PCI and the cabbage group in the stage one, two, and three renal function groups. It is known that the CKD is a risk factor for high adverse event after revascularization, but it is not known whether the absence of the CKD increased the adverse event in the patient. This study found that the patient with mild renal dysfunction often have a more comorbidity and advanced CAD when compared to the patient with normal renal function, but the baseline, but when the baseline characteristics were corrected for by the PS matching, those with the mild renal impairment did not have or increased the did not have or increased the risk of the primary composite outcome of death or spontaneous MI at the stroke. In contrast, the patient with a moderate renal dysfunction have a higher risk of adverse event. Long-term comparative outcome after PCI and cabbage were similar in terms of the primary composite outcome in each group with a normal and mild or moderate renal dysfunction. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, if there's any questions, please. Uh, speak up. So what did you do with the stage fours and stage fives? Did you, is that a separate analysis? Uh, yes, the, the initial analysis, so we include the all, stage of, all stage of the renal function, including the stage four and five. The stage, stage four and five, they show the, is mean, I mean the CKD. The, the CKD have a high adverse event after revascularization is the PEG is well known. In the in the in the all cardiologists or the the Jack editor uh, recommend the on recommend the analysis on including the stage one and two and three because that's more not so well known I guess um, uh, uh, for that it is interesting that the the mild renal dysfunction didn't seem you know didn't seem to do worse after you adjusted for everything, uh, everything else in a, in a large sample. So that surprised me because yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's, you know, it's a continuous variable. The, you know, somewhere there's, the, there's a, a graded relationship, but it seems like that, you know, that group that did pretty well. And I, I do like the fact that you had 10-year follow-up. That's, that's great uh, to have that. Did you um, have a different management plan for patients who have you know, stage two or three, meaning more hydration, more stage procedure, uh, I'm not quite sure I saw that. Do you manage them differently? Yes, yeah, so when we, the, when you meet the patient with the moderate renal dysfunction, we make a, make a strategy to protect the renal function, including the hydration, and it, although it, it is not, it is not recommend the guideline, the, we, we usually routinely the, uh, Impugion the acetyl acetyl yeah. yes. mm. Do you think that the same will be true for TAVI patients? Yeah, pardon me. Do you think that the similar finding you have with the TAVI? Oh yes, there. In in the patient who underwent the TAVI, we usually the many contrasts compared to the PCI patient. So maybe I I I think there's similar outcome in the patient who underwent Tatabi. Yeah. Uh, I have one question uh, <laughs> regards the previous, uh, your answer. Uh, in those patients revascularized uh, percutaneously, they are one stage or two or three stage revascularization? And this is uh, concerning about the the, the risk stratification, when you do a risk stratification, you calculate even the amount of the allowed contrast. So when you have this allowed contrast, you can d d devise the patients in one or two or three uh, stage procedures. But your patient, the multivessel patient, they were one stage or three stage or two stage revascularization, percutaneously, I mean, percutaneously. We, we uh, 
in the Asam Medical Center, we we usually the uh, if the patient have if the patient show the complex patient, complex uh, coronary artery disease, we usually do under do the PCI uh, with stays the PCI. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next uh, presentation. Is to by Dr. Jinson Park. Um, he's going to talk about effect of optimal medical therapy on long-term outcomes after myocardial infarction, uh, revascularization, 10 years. Well. Hello, I'm Jin Sun Park from Asam Medical Center. I'm the clinical fellow of the Asam Medical Center. Today, I present about impact of optimal medical therapy on long-term outcomes after myocardial revascularization for multivessel coronary disease. So here's the background. The importance of optimal medical therapy has been emphasized for treatment of patients with coronary artery disease. However, the definition of OMT was varied amongst this, and antiplatelet and statin therapies have been considered as mandatory secondary prevention after coronary revascularization, but the evidence of long-term use of beta blockers or AC inhibitor ARBs without heart failure or previous myocardial infarction are still lacking. So this study sought to determine the prognostic impact of OMT on long-term outcome in patients with multivessel CAD after myocardial revascularization. Uh, using the data from Asam Multivessel Registry from January 2003 to April 2018, we identified the patient who underwent revascularization either isolated coronary artery bypass grafting or percutaneous coronary intervention. Uh, and we define OMT was uh, at least three medications of the following four types of drugs at three years after index revascularization, uh, antiplatelet, beta blocker, and AC inhibitor or ARBs and statin. Uh, here's two uh, comp outcomes, uh, a cause of death and serious composite outcome. Serious composite outcome was uh, defined as from any cause, spontaneous myocardial infarction or stroke at 10 years. To reduce bias of this crude cost study, we applied propensity score matching and inverse probability of treatment weighting. Here is the result. This is a study di diagram. Uh, among 12,952 patients in the registry, finally we identified 8,000 uh, 311 eligible patients who met our inclusion and exclusion criteria. We exclude STEMI patients and patients with incomplete medication data and include patients with the first or second generation DES stenting and patients with KBG during the DES generation. Among all eligible patients, uh, 4,321, about 52% patients uh, took OMT. Here's a baseline characteristics according to OMT status. Uh, mean age are 63 years in both OMT and non-OMT group, and male dominance was also prominent in both group. In general, compared to patients without OMT, those with OMT had a higher mean body mass index and had a relatively higher prevalence of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and more presentation of stable angina and more PCI treatment. By contrast, patients with OMT had a lower proportion of a prior heart failure, chronic kidney disease, left main disease, and complete revascularization status. Uh, this is a clinical outcome at 10 years according to OMT status. Um, on adjusted and adjusted event rates, uh, uh, as you can see, on adjusted all-cause mortality rate at 10 years of OMT group was 9.9% and OMT group was 18.6%. On adjusted serious composite outcome at 10 years of OMT group was 14.3% and non-OMT group was 22.5%. Uh, it's uh, lower in OMT group uh, compared to non-OMT group. In propensity score matched code, all cause mortality rate at 10 years of OMT group was 10.7% and non-OMT group was 18.7%. And serious composite outcome at 10 years of OMT group was 14.5%, non-OMT group was 22.5%. 
After adjustment compared to non-OMT status, OMT status was associated with significantly lower risk of death. The hazard ratio was 0.55. It was significant. And serious composite outcome, uh, the hazard ratio was 0.56. So overall results were consistent in the sensitivity analysis using IPTW. The adjusted risk of all-cause mortality and serious composite outcome were significantly lower in the OMT group than in the non-OMT group. Uh, it was more clear in this figure. Uh, adjusted long-term outcomes favored the OMT group over the non-OMT group with respect to all-cause mortality and serious composite outcome. And this is a cumulative risk of all-cause mortality and serious composite outcome according to OMT. Uh, were significantly lower in the OMT group and constant in both PCI and KBG stratum, the treatment stratum. However, it might more prominent in the PCI group. Uh, uh, then uh, cabbage group, sorry. Uh, and the uh, cumulative risk of all cause mortality and serious composite outcome were constantly lower in the OMT group than in uh, non OMT group, regardless of the complete revascularization status. So, this is a key figure. Uh, the long term impact of OMT, the adjusted hazard ratio of a clinical outcome stratified each stratum of PCI or cabbage and complete revascularization or incomplete revascularization are summarized. In the propensity score matched court and adjusted with the use of IPTW, the effect of OMT on all cause mortality and serious composite outcome were more prominent in the PCI group than in the cabbage group. So the p-value for interaction was 0 0.001 for all cause mortality. The interactions were uh, was uh, significant. So this is the main finding of this uh, study. Uh, first, approximately half, 52% of patients were on OMT status during long-term follow-up, which was higher in the PCI group and in the IR group. After adjustment using propensity score analysis compared to patients without OMT, those with OMT had a significantly lower risk of all cause mortality and serious composite outcome of death, spontaneous MI, or stroke at 10 years. And the long-term benefit of OMT was more prominent in the PCI group than in the cabbage group, in which significantly uh, interactions were present between OMT status and revascularization type of all cause mortality. The benefit of OMT was consistent irrespective of CR or IR status. So, in patients with multiverse CAD who underwent coronary revascularization, long-term maintenance of OMT status was significantly associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality and serious composite outcome of death, spontaneous MI, or stroke at 10 years. The effect of OMT was more remarkable in the PCI group than in the cabbage group. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you clarify the definition of OMT again? Because you have obviously four class of medicine, and only if you take three of them, it yes. will be called OMT. Is there also a target of the, for example, the LDL in the statin group? Uh, it, it, so do you stratify the how good is your OMT in that particular patient? Oh, OK, thank you for your good question. Uh, in our registry, uh, we did not focus. Uh, we didn't know the reason of the prescription of this medication. So the target of the therapy, we didn't know the target of the therapy. We just know the combination of the drugs. I, I had one methodologic question I just wanted to clarify. I, I noticed that all of your Kaplan-Meier curve started at three years. Did you censor all the events that happened before three years uh, for some reason? Uh, I guess. I that. Okay. Uh, we did some uh, several analysis, uh, but I think the analysis from three, after three years is more clear to understand the result or the outcomes. Uh, but we did, we, uh, I, uh, we are now analysts about one year out uh, after index, uh, after one year after index revascularization was doing now, 
And the, the point about the cabbage versus P PCI differences, I think, is a really important one. Um, it's, we published something on this 20 years ago at, at uh, the Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City. That, uh, and I think it's an important thing for us to realize as clinicians that if we have it, that inability to take you know, or to, to be adherent to uh, optimal medical therapy is um, something that one should consider when deciding on a revascularization strategy. PCI really requires better adherence to the medications, at least for the first 10 years. And I think you showed that very nicely, and that's a, that's a really important finding. Oh, thank you. In your analysis, did you sort out uh, which one is more important, beta blocker or the AAC inhibitor in the patient without heart failure? Oh, uh, uh, as you know, the important medication of these drugs is antiplatelet and statin, and the other drugs, uh, we didn't know the best drug or the combination of the study but we did some uh, further analysis now. And uh, have you tried to reanalyze re the outcome using, I mean, pa patients taking all four classes of drugs? Are they doing even better? Oh, no, we did uh, some different criteria, including four types of inc uh, medications, but the result is well, uh, uh, similar, similar with the present study, but a uh, little bit uh, higher outcomes because I think uh, un unmatched uh, groups between OMT and non-OMT, and the, I think the patient who can take four types of medication is some, has some characteristics, I think. I think we need to move on. Uh, this is a really interesting discussion, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. The, um, our next presentation uh, is um, uh, by Dr. ho Yun Kim on the prognostic role of routine stress testing in diabetic patients after PCI insights from the post-PCI trial. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm ho Yun Kim, a clinical fellow from Asan Medical Center. Today, I'm going to talk about prognostic role of routine stress testing in diabetic patients after PCI, key analysis from post-PCI trial. I have nothing to disclose. 2018 ESC guideline for myocardial revascularization suggests that surveillance by non-invasive imaging-based stress testing may be considered in high-risk patients subset six months after revascularization with 2B, class 2B recommendation, and routine non-invasive imaging-based stress testing may be considered one year after PCI with class 2B recommendation. However, the level of evidence was C. So in this clinical context, the post-PCI trial uh, which was a randomized, pragmatic randomized trial uh, in which a total of 1,706 patients with high risk anatomical or clinical characteristics who underwent successful PCI were randomly assigned to the functional testing group and the standard care group. The post-PCI trial concluded that functional routine functional testing did not reduce the major adverse cardiovascular event compared to standard care group. Uh, before uh, However, considering that diabetic patients have a more aggressive form of atherosclerosis and more extensive coronary artery disease, and diabetes is a major determinant of adverse clinical events after myocardial revascularization. Also, PCI for diabetic patients is often being more complex and anatomically challenging. So it is unclear whether diabetic patients who underwent PCI could benefit from routine surveillance stress testing during follow-up. So using the post-PCI trial data, uh, we assessed the primary composite outcome of deaths from any cause, MI, or hospitalization for unstable angina at two years, and secondary outcomes including invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization. Uh, so we stratified patients with and without diabetes and further classified into patients into, function, into the functional testing group and standard care group. All patients enrolled in the original post-PCI trial were included in this pre-specified subgroup analysis. Patients must have at least one of the following high-risk anatomical or clinical characteristics. A left main bifurcation, osteal lesion, chronic total occlusion lesion, multivessel disease, re-stenotic lesion, diffuse lung lesion, and or bypass graft disease. Clinical characteristics consist of diabetes, chronic renal failure, and enzyme positive or enzyme positive acute coronary syndrome. Exclusion, patients with uh, patients presenting with cardiogenic shock uh, only treated with bare metal stents or balloon angioplasty, or patients with uh, life expectancy less than one year were excluded. 
So 1,706 patients in the post-PCI trial were stratified by diabetes status, status and then classified into the routine functional testing and standard care group. And they were followed up two years and analysis were made at two years. Two years. This is a baseline characteristics table. Patients with diabetes were older, were relatively more likely to be female, and were more likely to have histories of hypertension, previous PCI, stroke, and atrial fibrillation. Patients with diabetes uh, were more likely to have multivessel disease, chronic renal failure, were, and were less likely to have bifurcation lesion and chronic total occlusion lesion. Uh, patients with diabetes had higher number of disease lesion uh, compared with patients without diabetes. This, uh, is a primer, this is the primary composite outcome uh, composite of desferomenicus MI or hospitalization for unstable angina at two years between diabetes and non-diabetes. Patients with diabetes had about 50% higher risk of the primary composite outcome compared with patients without diabetes. Uh, and deaths from any cause composite of deaths or MI hospitalization were more frequently occurred in patients with diabetes. However, invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization, there were no differences between diabetes, diabetics and non-diabetics. And uh, this is uh, a primary composite outcome stratified by diabetes status and randomization group. In patients with diabetes, there was no difference between the functional testing group and standard care group. And also in non-diabetic patients, there was no difference between the functional testing group and standard care group. So there was no interaction between diabetes status and randomization group. And this table shows that uh, there, uh, in diabetics and non-diabetics, there, no there were no differences between the routine functional testing group and standard care group for the primary composite outcome and major secondary outcomes. However, invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization occurred more frequently in the functional testing group in both diabetics and non-diabetics. Uh, so we, uh, to assess the time-dependent pattern of clinical outcomes, we did uh, landmark analysis at one year. In patients with diabetes, uh, the primary composite outcome there was no difference between functional testing group and standard care group from randomization to one year and from one year to two years. However, invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization, there was no difference uh, from uh, randomization to one year. However, invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization occurred more frequently from one year to two years in, uh, in the functional testing group. And also in non-diabetic patients, the results uh, looked similar. Primary composite outcome, there was no difference between the functional testing group and standard care group from randomization to one year and one year to two years. However, invasive coronary angiography, uh, there was no difference from one year to, uh, from randomization to one year. However, uh, in the functional testing group, invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization occurred more frequently from one year to two years. Despite, uh, despite the higher rates of invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization, as you can see here, there was no difference between the functional testing group and standard care group in both diabetics and non-diabetics. So in conclusion, patients with diabetes had, uh, in, had an inc increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events at two years, and the adverse cardiovascular events rate did not differ between the routine functional testing group and the standard care group, both in patients with and without diabetes. And invasive coronary angiography and repeat revascularization after one year occurred more frequently in the functional testing group irrespective of diabetes status. However, this additional invasive management did not reduce major adverse cardiovascular events or mortality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, can you remind me when was when were the stress tests done in the trial? Was it at one uh, year? At one year. Okay, so that's why they yeah, switched yes. over at one year. At, yes, that's at, the reason. At one year. So should we? I mean, has this trial influenced clinical care in Korea? Uh, sorry. So in Korea, ah, yeah. um, is, did this trial change the way people care for patients or any guidelines? Uh, I think uh, it uh, it have not influenced the routine practice. 
uh, because there are many issues. So, yeah. The, uh, probably in the United States as well, I think. But it's, uh, I think it's getting, it, it's, it's hard to find a good medical reason to do stress testing in these patients. Yeah, <laughs> wait for so. symptoms. Yeah, great. Is there anything else pressing? Otherwise, yeah. JC? Did you have no, I, so. no, it's someone down there. Okay. okay uh, Go ahead. So, Go ahead. Uh, even in diabetics, uh, we don't need to do functional testing. So, uh, who do you think is the best candidate for functional testing? Uh, Guideline-based uh, symptomatic patients must have fun uh, functional tests, and in asymptomatic patients, um, appropriate use guideline recommend that uh, functional testing after two year in PCI patient and after five year for cabbage patients. So I think that five or five years after cabbage and two years after PCI, it would be reasonable. And I think that this uh, this study. It, it is the limitation of this study that uh, the, the duration of follow-up was relatively short. So I think that uh, five years after, uh, there can be a difference in diabetic patient, I think. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the next presentation. We have two more. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, next is uh, Dr. Uh, Jung Hyun Khan. Um, he's going to He's going to talk about uh, early percutaneous mitral commissurotomy versus, uh, or conventional management uh, for asymptomatic mitral stenosis, a randomized clinical trial. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about uh, our randomized clinical trial comparing outcomes of early percutaneous mitral commissurotomy versus conventional management for asymptomatic mitral stenosis. I don't have any disclosure relevant to this presentation. Percutaneous mitral commissurotomy, PMC, has become the standard treatment for symptomatic patients with rheumatic mitral stenosis. However, the decision to perform PMC on asymptomatic patients requires careful weighing of the potential benefits against the risks of early PMC. Current guidelines recommend the PMC for asymptomatic patients only with significant primary hypertension, high thromboembol risk, or very severe mitral stenosis. Preemptive early PMC can be justified only when there is clear evidence that early PMC improves long-term outcomes compared with conventional treatment. The major hypothesis of the Mitogate trial was that Early PMC would decrease the rate of cardiovascular mortality and systemic thromboembolic events as compared with conventional treatment. We conducted a prospective multicenter randomized trial in asymptomatic patients with severe mitral stenosis, defined as mitral valve area between 1.0 and 1.5 square centimeter, age of 20 to 70 years. Uh, patients with symptoms, uh, significant mitral regurgitation, significant primary hypertension, uh, total echo score greater than 10, or left atrial thrombi were excluded. Patients were randomly assigned on a one to one basis to early PMC or conventional <laughs> treatment. In the early PMC group, PMC should be performed within three months of randomization. Patients in the conventional treatment group were treated according to the current guidelines and referred for PMC if they became symptomatic or if mitral valve mitral area decreased to smaller than 1.0 square centimeter. Uh, anticoagulation was effectively maintained in all patients during the entire follow-up period uh, in all patients with atrial fibrillation or prior embolic events. The uh, primary endpoint was defined as a composite of PMC-related complications uh, such as uh, procedure-related mortality or urgent mitral surgery, cardiovascular death, cerebral infarction, and systemic thromboembolic events. Secondary endpoints included all cause death and mitral valve replacement. Based on our previous observation study published in the, in the European Heart Journal, uh, the sample size of 166 patients uh, was, was estimated. 
uh, a total of 372 asymptomatic patients with severe mitral stenosis were screened for eligibility. Uh, 106 patients, 67 patients underwent endorheization, and we uh, randomly assigned this patient to early PMC group, early 84 patients, were conventional treatment, 83 patients. The treatment groups were generally very balanced with in regard to baseline characteristics. Mean age was 55 years, 83% uh, were female, uh, 51 patients had atrial fibrillation, and 56 patients received anticoagulation therapy. Uh, mean mitral valve area was 1.23 square centimeter. Mean transmitral trans gradient was uh, 82 millimeter mercury. Total echo score mean averaged uh, 8.1. Uh, the, the primary endpoint occurred in nine patients in the conventional treatment group and seven patients in the early PMC group. The hazard ratio was 0.77. Uh, the difference was not significant. Uh, all cause deaths occurred in three patients in the conventional treatment group and four patients in the early PMC group. The difference was also not significant. The cumulative incidence of primary endpoints uh, mm -hmm. also, uh, the cumulative uh, incidence of primary endpoints also differed uh, not significantly. 12.7% uh, at eight years in the conventional treatment group and 9.8% at eight years in the conventional early PMC group. Death from any causes were also similar between the two groups. Uh, per protocol, the results of per protocol analysis uh, were also consistent with uh, those of primary intention to treat analysis. Uh, our study has several limitations. Uh, first, uh, our, study, uh, our study population uh, did not represent all asymptomatic patients with uh, severe mitral stenosis because those with very severe mitral stenosis, uh, mitral valve area uh, smaller than 1.0 square centimeter, uh, significant pulmonary hypertension, uh, age older than 70 years, uh, poor medical condition or unfavorable mitral valve load for PMC were not included. Uh, crossover occurred in 11%. Uh, in conclusion, early PMC as compared with conventional management did not reduce the incidence of the composite of cardiovascular events among asymptomatic patients with severe mitral stenosis. The results of the Mitogate trial suppose uh, adherence to current guidelines emphasizing careful clinical and cardiographic surveillance in such patients. Thank you for attention. Thank you, very nice. Um, clarify the crossover percentage, 11% of the conventional patient population received balloon valvuloplasty uh, yeah. over that period of time? Uh, yes, uh, two, uh, crossover occurred in two ways. <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, after the patient uh, was randomized to early PMC group, uh, some patients changed the, the mind. Yeah, their mind. So, they, they cross over to uh, conventional treatment group. Yeah. Cross over occurred in two ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if a conventional group patient received balloon valvuloplasty, does that count as an outcome? Uh, During yeah, the yeah. So uh, no, right? I, I'm not sure, but about, uh, 20, about 20, 12, 20% 20 of patients uh, became symptomatic or uh, mitral valve area decreased to smaller than 1.0 square centimeter. Uh, but but it, was, it was smaller number than expected yeah. uh, anyway. The patient also included in the you know, intention to treat analysis, but uh, even patients uh, who underwent uh, PMC uh, in later during follow-up 
the outcome did not, was not different between early and late PMC, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very interesting because the follow-up is quite long, yeah. right? I mean, let's say six years because eight was a little small, but it seems like you're just delaying or just following them. It doesn't harm too yeah, much, right? Because you can do it later, 20%. And a lot of them actually have a stable didn't have anything. They didn't do anything. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it is very interesting. I mean, the patients here obviously were um, somewhat older than the patients who might undergo uh, mitral valvuloplasty in some places where rheumatic heart disease is more endemic, like India, I think, and uh, Africa, where I think a lot of the patients are in their 30s um, who have it, or in the United States, where, you know, again, I think we see older. you know, older patients, it, it, and most of them are immigrants, frankly, uh, in the U.S. So I think this is a great study because it really answers some que important questions about the areas where mitral valvuloplasty has a level two indication in the guidelines. The level one is still, you know, symptoms treat. Uh, but I really applaud you. I didn't even realize this study had been conducted, so thank you for sharing it. And I think the stroke rate is actually the concern, right? So I think appropriate patients should probably be anticoagulated if they, you know, large atrium, may have an episode of PAF. So I think that is probably what is important in the conventional group to prevent them have thromboembolic event. Yeah, as compared with uh, severe aortic stenosis, uh, uh, I also, the, I, I'm, I was the also PI of the recovery trial, so, <laughs> so the, uh, the natural history is uh, remarkably different between aortic stenosis and mitral, especially in uh, developed country, uh, mitral stenosis between, uh, in the range of 1.0 and 1.5 is very stable. Yeah. And, uh, uh, the stroke and stroke was the thrombolytic event rates was much lower than expected uh, compared as uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> and uh, trial patients uh, had very uh, regular follow-up and received uh, uh, received anticoagulant therapy uh, perfect completely. So. Uh, PMC does not <laughs> uh, achieve so prevention of uh, system thrombolytic events, and additionally to uh, in anticoagulant therapy. Thank you very much. Really interesting uh, study. Uh, our last uh, presentation is by Dr. Yanwoo Choi um, on uh, valvular and paravalvular thrombosis after TAVR, a cardiac CT substudy from ADAPT TAVR. Uh, thank you for introducing. Uh, I am uh, Yonu Che, a clinical fellow at Asan Medical Center, and I am going to talk about today is the cardiac CT substudy of the adaptive type of trial about the incidence, predictors, and clinical impact of valvular and perivalvular thrombosis of the type of patient. This is age disclosure. Tabor is a standard treatment option for patients with symptomatic severe AS, and it's uh, Indications are expanding. However, the incidence of leaflet thrombosis found on cardiac CT performed as a follow-up after travel varies depending on the study, but has been reported to range from 7% to 80, uh, 38%. Studies have shown that leaflet thrombosis is associated with this cerebral vascular event. In addition, not only valvular thrombosis, but also perivalvular thrombosis has been reported, but the incidence and clinical implications are still unknown. Through this study, we investigate the incidence and predictor of valvular and perivalvular thrombosis at the table and clinical impact and relationship between these phenomena and neurology outcomes. Adopted table trial was a study that confirmed the outcome who received table and excluding patients who had an indication of long-term anticoagulation and randomized them into the Etoxaban versus adapt group. Among them, a total of 211 patients who, for whom cardiac CT data was, were available were included. CT was performed at six months to confirm thrombosis, and thrombosis was divided into leaflet thrombosis and perivalvular thrombosis, which are supravalvular, subvalvular, and sinus of valvular thrombosis, depending on each location. 
Brain MRI was performed to confirm the occurrence of cerebral thromboembolism. Baseline MRI was performed between one and seven days after travel before discharge. And follow-up MRI was performed six months later. Using the NIH SSS care, modified ranking scan, Montreal cognitive, cognitive assessment, functional impairment was confirmed. These are primary endpoint and secondary endpoint. Primary endpoint was the incidence of thrombosis at RT5 complex. As for the incidence of thrombosis in the RT5 complex, 91 out of 211 patients showed a total incidence of 43%. And among them, uh, thrombosis in the RT5 uh, in the valve leaflet was 14%, and perivalvular thrombosis in 38%, and one patient has supravalvular thrombosis, and 57 per patient has subvalvular thrombosis, and 37 patients had the sinus of valvular thrombosis. <coughs> this is baseline characteristics and procedural characteristics. There is no difference except BSA. Using logistic regression to confirm the predictor, it was confirmed that uh, smaller BSA and uh, smaller valve level maximum diameter, the more thrombosis of the aortic valve complex. In the case of leaflet thrombosis, scaled with the creatinine of 50 or less was confirmed as a predictor of leaflet thrombosis. In the case of peri perivalvular thrombosis, as in the case of the aortic valve complex, the smaller BSA and the smaller valve level maximum diameter, the more thrombosis occurred. The new results on MRI and functional impairment according to thrombosis or not, that there was no significant difference. CT showed the thrombosis, but it did not affect the occurrence of thromboembolic event or neurological functional impairment. The same result was shown when only leaflet thrombosis and when perivalvular thrombosis. Even in other clinical outcomes I evaluated, there was no difference in the result according to the presence or absence of thrombosis. In this analysis, the incidence of thrombosis of the table occurred at about 40%, valvular at 14%, and perivalvular at 37%, showing similar results to other reports previously. However, uh, in previous papers confirming natural history, spontaneous resolution was also confirmed at 56%, and hard to show the dynamic course. So, it is difficult to talk about the correlation between the neurology outcomes and this imaging phenomenon confirmed by CT at six months. Thrombosis of the arctic valve complex has been explained by various mechanisms, such as unexcised calcified native valve leaflet and altered shape of native sinus and flow stasis and change, change in flow pattern due to a new formation of neo sinus. Implantation depth is also known to affect the occurrence of thrombosis by affecting the flow of the neo sinus and anatomical sinus, but in this study, it was not possible to accurately measure the disease risk factors, so there were no confirmed parts for these factors. Similar to the result of a meta analysis study on the risk factor of the subclinical leaflet thrombosis, the decrease in renal function was confirmed, but there were no particularly similar parts identified in the BSA or post tabo aortic valve area, and there may be the possibility of incidental finding that occurred due to a small number of events or patient number. Previously, flat thrombosis increased the risk of TIA or stroke, and there were also studies uh, that or anticoagulation was helpful in preventing thrombosis and regression of thrombosis. But the original study and this sub-study showed different results from previous studies by confirming the, that the use of DAPT or NOAC was not related to the occurrence of leaflet thrombosis, and this was also not related to TIA or stroke. In conclusion, valvular and perivalvular thrombosis of the tower are very common. However, they do not seem to be related to thromboembolic event and neurologic 
cardiovascular dysfunction and clinical outcome. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It's a, a good to see some additional information coming forward from that study. So based on a, a, two questions for you. One is, are you doing longer term follow up to see whether there are consequences of six month thrombosis on valve degeneration? Is that ongoing? Uh, sorry. Can so I... are, you, are you looking at longer term echocard echocardiograms to see if thrombosis predicts valve degeneration? No, we don't have an extended follow up. Oh. We just six months follow up. So it's not, there's no longer follow up in the study? Yeah, yes. No, that's too bad. The, and what, on the basis of this study, what is now the preferred antithrombotic regimen in patients who have no anti anticoagulation indication at Asan Medical Center? Sorry, sorry. What is your current practice for these types of patients? Do you give single antiplatelet therapy, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy? We are doing TABO and get the drugs we use DAPT. So DAPT? Yeah, for six months and then change it to single antiplatelet. Single antiplatelet. Yeah. So can we show a so show of hands on the panel uh, for how many are using dual antiplatelet therapy for a routine TAVR? Single antiplatelet? The, uh, so I think it's, uh, it's, it still is an area of controversy, obviously, uh, for it. The, I think you know, the signal of valve thrombosis is very interesting, of HALT, uh, that's consistent across all of the studies of uh, uh, DOACs. Um, and so it, it, I think the important question now is whether that leads to degeneration or not. So that's why I was asking. Okay, thank you. I think we need to finish, uh, finish up. I thank all the uh, presenters uh, and the panelists uh, for an excellent discussion and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.